Good morning. We're at the home of Professor and Mrs. Georgi Kepish in uh, Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Professor Kepish is an artist, educator, author, founder and first director of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at uh, MIT. 21 years ago, I received a grant to visit Mr. Professor Kepish at MIT and learn more about the center. I did not come then for a number of reasons. However, I am here now and it's indeed a pleasure to finally meet your, make your acquaintance, Professor Kepish. This interview is about, or the reason for the interview at this time is that the California College, uh, California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, California, is having a show at the student uh, gallery uh, directed by uh, Dr. Uh, this is <coughs> Dr. Jean LaBarbera. And uh, since you uh, were unable to visit us for the opening of the show and present, to present your ideas, uh, I was asked to come here and in some way document some words that you may have uh, for the audience or the community in, in California. The, the, the show is about the wedding of art and science in service to, uh, to society, to community. Uh, originally, I first heard of your dream you know, when I read uh, some articles in a uh, uh, magazine, uh, or a couple of magazines. And uh, my interest is in knowing what, was your, what were your original uh, intentions, your dreams, I mean, in terms of goals and uh, objectives. Would you just elaborate on that? I will try, but as you know, all this kind of confrontation with one's inner reality with an outside world, it's not an easy assignment, but uh, maybe I should start with a mini autobiography. I grew up in, as, my, as a child in Hungary, and my involvement with life was the hardship of life. I grew up first after the First World War, and it had many both tragedies and hopes. Usually when you are seeing very dark, then you have at least the dreams of much light. And so that was my own life, always confronting with the sadness or the tragedies of social and personal life and I was hoping to compensate for the missing part by dreaming about b much better worlds than I had. And so my interest in art was not just a personal subjective a kind of anger about a misplaced existence, but a dream about an optimum existence. And so since my early youth, I had always utopian dreams, how to f converge whatever we have in this life and utilize all means and all tools and all equipment into a realizing a richer, better, more honest life than we can have without this extra scaffolding of existence. As I know now for many years of practice, my English is still Hungarian. And if you feel I derailed from legible or understanding, please interrupt me and ask new questions. So for the time being, that should be it. Originally, when I, uh, I mentioned that 21 years ago, I applied for a grant to come to, to visit you. My primary reason for that is I too am extremely interested in, in, uh, in art as a means of raising social consciousness. Uh, my parents came from Mexico as uh, farm workers and I grew in Kansas and when I read uh, of your intentions of bringing about social change, that attracted me extremely because that still remains, uh, remains uh, ceremonial in my efforts and my artistic efforts. Uh, how were you specifically, through your center, 
going to resist or raise social and environmental consciousness, that is, uh, an ecological uh, uh, awareness. Uh, what were the, 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 the processes that you were going to pursue? Maybe, like everybody, when one has a distant goal, has to set priorities. And when I had this utopian hope to create conditions which will optimize one's existence, I had to recognize that in a certain way we are shaped by our environment. And so my priority was to create an artistic awareness of the positive and negative aspect of our environment. And I was fully aware I was an addict of William Morris and uh, oh, Ruskin and 90th century dreamers. And I knew that uh, living and growing up in 19th century slums was um, had some role in setting the goals of this great old thinker or dreamers in a world which has richer environment. And so my own goals and dreams were shaped by this notion that to be a full human being, you have to have a conditions which lets you grow up fully. And so my really dreams were, and I use the term again, to find a living condition which optimizes one's awareness of what is wrong and try to set targets of what could be better and could be richer. I was uh, an addict of William Morris and Ruskin. In this time it was a rather neglected area of dreaming and so I tried to find goals which was starting from Ruskin, Morris and Carlyle and some of the 19th century dreamers and tried to go not beyond but try to reinforce their dreams with greater honest reality. And so my interest was to create with education or through the education and art and a living condition which seems to project one's neglected dreams, which was to create an environment which gives an individual human the chance to be fully human. And so that's in a nutshell, in a cracked nutshell, <laughs> my early dreams. You uh, mentioned in one of your writings that coming to MIT and uh, uh, the Harvard uh, area, uh, that the cultural times were ripe, were right for you to establish this center. Uh, what do you mean by the cultural times were right for the establishment of your center? I'm always concerned when I'm confronted with my own statements because one dramatizes, exaggerates beliefs and conditions. What I meant that is right that we were rather dislocated from our better self. And one sees light only in darkness. I know it sounds paradox, but it's not my paradox. It was Master or Meister Eckhart, the great 19th, 13th century German dreamer who said so. And what he may have meant, at least as I can see, was that you cannot really see your clearest self without seeing the negation of your best self. And I thought after the Second World War and all these bloody difficulties what my generation or a little older than my generation had to go through has to be corrected and the best way of correcting was or could have been if we face what we don't have from the full humanness. And the full humanness is that um, we have all the intensity and richness of individual life without neglecting social obligation. And 
that seems to be the crisis or critical aspect of our existence that 19th century project that a great deal of honest big dreams and these big dreams were derailed and the reality was far from these dreams and as you are coming from Mexico, did you grow up in Mexico? No, my parents uh, I see. Are, are, are from Mexico. I was born in the uh, uh, in the barrio of uh, Kansas City. I see. So, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the the practices, the cultural practices of of, of uh, my parents is, were uh, uh, prevalent, uh, dominant in our in our home. In any case, maybe through the reflected light, you could sense the richness of the Mexican small scale of existence. Definitely. And <clears throat> so when you form your own dreams, these dreams were partly woven around these early experiences what you partly got or inherited from your parents. And I had a little similar condition that I had my own childhood dreams of a rich life, which was fresh air, blue sky, honest human relationship. And in this condition, I recognized when I came to MIT that we have all the means or tools, but we miss the essential, the heart of it. And so my target when I came to MIT had to modify it because I saw the means, but I observed that the hard targets were not anymore there. <coughs> I, uh, I believe that that is what has always, in reading your writings, your books, articles, that core, that, that, that sense that you just described uh, of, of, uh, of uh, more simpler ways, the more a sense of community uh, in, in, in your home life in Hungary and, 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 and in my home life in Kansas, although uh, it was Kansas, it was still a Mexican household. We practiced our, a sense of community, a togetherness. Uh, we were, I'm from a large family. And those are the things that has, to this very day, in, in reading your, your material, has always uh, corresponded, has kept me connected, and uh, where I have learned so much from your, your writings and practiced uh, using uh, your theories to underpin my work. Again, the, 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 the core of my work deals with bringing about social change. As you can see, I am a person of color, and we are in this country where where there are these kinds of problems. As a matter of fact, having to do with color of people, uh, you established the Center of Advanced Visual Studies in, 19, in the mid-60s, 1967. This was uh, in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement yes. to be followed by uh, uh, the various movements of uh, 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 free speech. Uh, at at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, then, of course, there followed the, 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 the uh, uh, environmental movement, not necessarily in that order, the women's movement. I personally uh, am a member of the United Farm Workers and uh, uh, attempting to bring about a better life, uh, a stronger life, a more equity in this country. Uh, do you have any specific instances in the work that has been done by the fellows who you brought to your institute or any of the work that done by others that, uh, that directly uh, deals with social change. Can you think of any specific instances? Not in the center, but in the family. Our daughter who has a, a who is now actually in, involved in uh, what is it, the en environment issues, and she's uh, partly a moving force of the urban garden movement here. She went to the South during the difficult times and she was arrested and she went through the whole kind of feeling the full strength of the trouble. And as we are very close to, closely knit family, 
I felt very strongly what she felt, or she felt strongly what my wife and myself felt. So I always had a strong sense of the underdog or the difficulties. And uh, also in my own experiences, I grew up born and grew up in the, if one can call it growing up, in the early part of the century. And I felt a great deal of the ideas what was expressed in, you, I'm sure you know, the music of Béla Bartók. And I felt also a great sympathy and involvement in the ideas that art has a major role in transforming the inner self. And we saw this inner transformation seems to me not very hopeful to transform the outside world. And so my own commitment was the transformation or hoping to contribute to the transformation of the inner self and hopefully in the future with the quality of experiences to shift gears and try to mobilize the social forces to make changes in the outside world. And I assume everything is basically interconnected and whatever I did in my own life, it was always not integrated but interwoven by the opposite factors. The inner life is the external world and the external world is the inner world. That's extremely interesting because as I sit here and look around this room, all the, uh, the, the art, the artifacts that I see here are artifacts that are interwoven or a part of life, integrated uh, with life. Uh, the crafts, the, 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 the rugs, uh, the, the, the uh, weavings, uh, uh, this, this type of thing. But I, and at the same time I notice a complete absence of uh, so-called modern art that uh, some people look at as as uh, being uh, art as commodity. You have art here as an ideology, as a facet of ideology. And, uh, but I don't, I don't see the art as commodity. Is this the reason, in other words, that you actually uh, feel so it's strong It's very difficult it? to point out the finger on a single factor mm -hmm. which makes one's life values. But <coughs> I feel, and my wife has the same need, that whatever we have around us should be radiating this quality of life which is coming from a committed existence. And somehow these simple art forms, the honest craft forms, have this inner radiation on the positive sense, at least for us. And what we have this on the top, this Peruvian fabric, which is maybe almost a thousand years old. And I think they are great pieces of art. I don't know whether you know the book of Boas, Franz Boas, Primitive Art. I learned from this book a great deal about Peruvian art. And so whatever I have around here is a conglomeration of everything which added to my own sensory clarification. <coughs> In one of your writings you mention, uh, Professor Kepesh, the idea that you and your colleagues many times felt frustrated that, that ideas were often clipped. That you would like to see these ideas fulfilled. I suppose what that meant was that some of the, 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 the students uh, or others uh, would, uh, would have a seed that looked as though it was about ready to bloom, give blossom into something powerful that dealt with the e uh, ecological consciousness and then it uh, perhaps died out or uh, was uh, translated into some as commodity or some kind of a product for making money, etc. And uh, the objective of uh, your center, your dream was, was again uh, perhaps centered on this uh, social environmental change consciousness. Uh, I know because of my own personal experience that California, which is incidentally uh, about 50 percent people of color, uh, who are very interested in social change, equity, part of the American, piece of the American dream, et cetera, et cetera. 
will, would find, particularly the artists, your, your writings that you did 21 years ago and beyond that, extremely important to their work now. The theories to underpin uh, their work in the broader, uh, large-scale uh, uh, context, that is, the urban environment. Uh, I believe that because of the uh, uh, present uh, social environmental crisis and what we know as the paradigm shift in terms of uh, design, that is, the paradigm shift that is of viewing the world again as, or, as an organism rather than as a mechanism the way we begin to view it right after the Industrial Revolution, uh, that uh, your, your, your work will receive an extreme amount of, of uh, how should I say, put it, uh, popularity, uh, importance. Uh, in the work of these artists that are now facing the future and must in some way confront this abyss that we are in, uh, at at this moment. Uh, California Polytechnic State University, which is located halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco, is extremely interested in that. It is an environmental uh, uh, center where the people are very seriously concerned about their, their environment. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do, do you, uh, how, how do you see this? Uh, I know that you have not visited uh, or lived in California, that is. You visited uh, from time to time, but. May I just say that I fully understand the question, that I answer the real question. You want to know what my response is to the present situation in California. It's, I have to be what the Roman called what as a future seeing to give a valid answer. I think as far as I can judge it from here, California has an incredible complex population and more mobile than any other part of this country or maybe any other part of the world. And consequently, the forecasting of what is the major social task and the reading the present situation, one has to have a clearer sense of living. And maybe I put it in other way. In order to give a valid comment of observation, I have to know more about present California. And whatever I know is from my very last trip, which was maybe uh, oh, 20 years ago, whenever it was, and some of the newspaper comments, which is always just uh, echoes of echoes and never has a clear notion of reality. But my guess is that California has an incredible complex social situation. And the fact that you, um, coming from a Mexican family, could be what you are, it implies that the potentials are immense and that in the middle of this kind of turmoil what we live in late 20th century, you have a maybe a better chance to send the pulse of life than any other part of the world. It was not the most lucid comment, but in any case the feeling was in. <coughs> in San Luis Obispo is very well known for the students, the young scientists, uh, engineers, etc., that they are producing. And it seems to me that by wedding those efforts of technology with art, whose function it is to alter consciousness, would not only broaden their perspectives, allow them to contribute to the welfare of society, but as you mentioned here in our conversation, give them more humanness, not exactly in those words that you put them, but, but a moreness to their humanity. 
And I am hoping that, and right now it's happening, that the liberal arts are being emphasized, are being encouraged. But I have a sense that, 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 that some of the students in the sciences don't, may not quite appreciate what does the liberal arts have to give them? How does it broaden them? How does it give them more power, make them more socially and environmentally responsible? I fully understand what you refer to, because when I came to MIT, I had a similar feeling. MIT was, during the time I came, the very end of the Second World War, it was really just the arsenal of the world. It had a tremendous competence in producing intelligent weapons without heart. And so when I came, I was practically shocked but I was lucky enough because I had a few good friends at MIT administration and I discovered that they are with us in the sense they feel also a great social loyalty and they are seeking like you or I was seeking uh, for implementing this loyalty in real life and not just dreaming and projecting sometimes utopian dreams but try to find the real means to bring it to concrete social reality. And I still feel that schools like yours and m mine or the MIT had an immense and still has an immense role in piloting not just the knowledge, but the heart of the knowledge and create circumstances which will raise the level of awareness of all problems, not just artistic problems, but all problems. And I feel fortunate in my life to be invited to MIT. I was there, I came there in 45, and that's a long time ago. And I never was disappointed. There are actually narrow-minded people everywhere, including a fair-minded world. And so I feel a lucky man to be able to be a participant in MIT search for a higher level of reality. And I made close friendship with some of the really major figures at MIT and I learned from them a great deal, not in terms of technical or scientific knowledge, but in their deep broad awareness of the issues what you are referring to. <coughs> In California, there is an assemblyman in Sacramento, which is the capital. His name is John Vasconcelos. He has implemented a program, a task force, that deals with uh, raising the self-esteem of citizens of the state of California. It's a task force. The governor, Duke Majin, approved a couple of years ago, more or less, several millions of dollars to support this program, the task force. Every county in the state of California is encouraged to have a local task force committee. It seems to me that using your philosophy, your theories, your writings, etc., as the underpinning structure for using the human-built environment, the cultural landscape, in order to dignify the lives of all people, the pluralistic society, to empower them rather than to disable them, which has been the practice by many. The way you control people is you lower the self-esteem. You deny them their, their culture. You deny them their, their history. And consequently, uh, you fragment them and destroy the community. And you can control them. And this is in the minds of many people part of what we call institutional racism. Now the idea is to reintegrate these people, to make use of history the, to, the, the, that deals with uh, the history of these people, the so-called minorities, who is not the history that has not been taught. And the vehicle, the medium of the human-built environment uh, 
coupled with the liberal arts taught at our universities throughout would play a central role of all of this, but it must start there in the curriculum and students taking courses in liberal arts, et cetera. But there you have a wedding of, 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 of uh, in my opinion, of, of science and arts being underpinned with your very good work uh, as a beginning. In any case, I share very, your hopes. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, uh, I want to thank you, Professor Kefish. I found that's extremely stimulating. I could go on and on. I have many other personal questions. I know that you now have uh, started, uh, gone into uh, continued painting. I don't think, in my opinion, uh, some people say that, that you've returned uh, to painting. In reading what you have been uh, doing in the past, I don't think you ever really left painting. No, I never. you are absolutely You right. never left painting. Uh, you never left uh, uh, the, the well from which all of the, all these aspirations and all these dreams spring from. The internal you, uh, you never left that. That's, that's where it's coming from. The integration of the interior and the exterior. Uh, uh, now it's being manifested on canvas, perhaps, but uh, as a painter, uh, I don't think that you've ever taken a break. A painter dreams, and the social human dreams too. And when these two dreams converge and they synchronize into a real existence, then you may produce something which has a quality and meaning. Are you? A painter too? No, when I was a child, I started, uh, 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 as I mentioned, uh, I was born in, in, in the barrio, in the railroad yards of Kansas. Constant, uh, consequently, I heard many of the sounds and, uh, and saw many of the images of uh, industrial America. At the same time, uh, I was, uh, I had access to uh, art teacher when I was uh, four or five years old, and I have always uh, practiced that. And I, I went to art schools when I was a young man, and, and then I also taught at the Kansas City Art, art Institute in the Foundation Department. Uh, and I always have pursued art, and I used to paint. But I think that what happened, and again, this is another reason why your work is extremely attractive to me, because it is also my work. Uh, is that the wedding of bringing these two things together, art, the express, visual expression of my aspirations, uh, being brought up in an environment uh, with machines surrounding us, et cetera, et cetera. It just never occurred to me that they could ever be separate. They were always together. So uh, I didn't leave one thing to go to the other. I just began to work in a different kind of way in a more conscious way. And again, because of my own personal lived experience uh, in, a, in, a, in a Mexican household, uh, uh, social change was extremely important to me. And that's the reason I pursued that. The reason that 21 years ago I did not come to visit is that, and perhaps I may have been mistaken, is that at the time I was teaching at the Kansas City Art Institute when I received the grant, I realized in reading what your intentions were that there, these were very high ideals and I shared them. I also know that uh, you mentioned uh, that some of the Bauhaus influences would be made uh, use of in the teaching, in the, the, the classes, the processes. I was working with uh, a group of people in the foundation department that were using those processes, so I was familiar with them. The other part about the social change, I thought that I would stand back and look. My assumption was that here you are, MIT and Harvard, where, generally speaking, fairly affluent individuals uh, were in attendance. Uh, I could not see at the time why these people would want to bring social change. Predominantly white students, 
upper middle class, and consequently I thought I'd wait. For the next several years I followed your work very closely in reading the Art Forum and reading these various magazines, etc., and some of your books, and that remained very solid. But I kept looking for things that were coming out of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, and I saw a lot of interesting things. But to my recollection, none, not your personal work, but none that were done, being done by the fellows that directly addressed social change, or no readings where the intention was mentioned. It were, there were ideas, the potential, possibly, the tools were there, but I never actually saw where they addressed social change. I finally, in 1968, put together a collaborative of 20 some odd painters, sculptors, uh, architects, landscape architects, etc., in Kansas to do a $22 million project using your ideas, your concepts, and we did it and we built it. But what I had to do, which was devious, perhaps, but much art is made is devious, was recycle some of the art that was for commodity, recycle it, uh, in order to use it. And uh, so I guess it was a process of deconstruction for the purpose of reconstruction for the future. Sounds promising. I would like to know more about it. I was, in fact, in the Kansas Art Institute some maybe five years ago. I think they gave me an honorary degree, something like that. I know I gave the commencement speech. Uh -huh. and, but uh, it was a short exposure, so I did not have too much chance to explore or exchange notions. I, <coughs> I, I want to conclude with uh, an observation which I am certain after meeting you and talking to you, being here in your own particular environment, your home, a comment that was made by an art critic which was, has always has been a question in my mind, but it's no, a question no longer. Uh, this, uh, was, uh, this comment was made um, by a critic by the name of uh, Pamela Alara or Ayata, depends on how you want to pronounce, pronounce it, Art News, October 1978 page 150, and it states in the article, uh, and the article is MIT Cambridge Exhibit. Across the river at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an exhibition of a more experiment Experimental artist Georgi Kepisch surveyed his paintings, photographs, and light sculpture from 1945 to 1947. This is influenced by German Expressionism and Russian Constructivism. Kepisch gave up painting in 1928 and 39. I think that's a first error. I don't think that you gave up the. I, I know I, I gave up yes. painting, but then it shifted gears. Right, into high, into another yes, shifted gears because he considered it to be an insufficient vehicle for motivating social change. He devoted himself to photography and film and in founding the Center for Advanced Visual Studies in 1967, hoped to facilitate the use of technology as an artistic medium in the cooperation of artists and scientists in large-scale urban projects. This goal, in her opinion, has produced a few positive results and Kepish returned to painting is in effect an admission of failure of his ideals. I do not believe that at all. Who was who wrote it? Pamela Alara. Alara. I will admit that when I read this article, as part of my research of your work, and I have many, many other articles, I have a very thick file 
on you and your work. And then you know more about me I than know. I know about myself, and definitely more than I know about you. <laughs> uh, the it, it was dis it's disturbing uh, to me not in that it cast a uh, a doubt about uh, the validity of your work to bring about social change, to bring about environmental change, but it disturbed me in that I felt that it was muddying the waters and that there were many artists who may read this or potential artists who may not receive the full potential of the power of, 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 of your work. But I, I have found in, with many art critics, that the perspective that they have is one of viewing art as commodity, solely as commodity, that it's fragmented disconnected from social, economic, and political realities. And this is not the case, in my opinion, in the kind of work that you're, you've been talking about, or that part of the work that attracts me, and that is art as a facet of ideology. That is a part of the fabric that does recognize this, the, uh, the political economy, that is, takes into account the social, economic, and political uh, realities in the process of mediation of your work. Only then, can you, only then can you actually bring about social change, alter consciousness, when you take it, place it, keep it in that context. Obviously, to me, she has removed it from that context. I don't know her, so I don't know what. And you know, uh, sometimes, if one projects a fragment of one's vista, you may misunderstanding what is in the background, and I don't know her ideas. Mm. Well, I uh, I'm very familiar <laughs> with uh, that type of strategy because I know that personally, in my case, uh, except for what my parents taught me at home, uh, I feel that as a person of color, that. Uh, there was an effort by some to fragment me from the context, from my history, my identity, and that type of thing. And it works in some cases. Thank you very much. No, you are more than kind. welcome. I wish I was more uh, clear and more intense. But as you may know my age, I'm not as fresh and not as alert as your mind must be now. I'm over 82, and I feel it off and on, and then one's alertness in this kind of dialogues is not as intense and not as fast to the other person. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed your question, and I wish and I hope that I will be valid enough and strong enough to make sense. Mm -hmm. And thanks for asking me. Well, your work is there, and it's lucid, and it's strong, and it's clear, and it sends some a message for the future, a, a, a direction. I hope you are absolutely right. I believe in it, but not everybody. Thank you again, Professor Kebrich. No, you are more than welcome. I would like to know more about your own work. I will uh, mail you uh, the uh, uh, slides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One thing that I have done, unfortunately, uh, in terms of academia, I have never allowed publication of my work. Uh, and I haven't for the simple reason that the publications that normally asked uh, were sort of glossy national architectural publications. Uh, not in that many instances. Uh, but sometimes an artist must mediate his or her own work, if the critics are not capable of doing it justice, such as in this case that I just quoted. And in one case where the Slick Magazine, uh, National Architectural Magazine, asked to do, publish my work, I wanted to on the condition that I would explain it. And uh, since that uh, permission was not forthcoming in the way that I wanted, then I didn't want it because 
that is important. The mediation is extremely important to the work. But I have uh, many slides, particularly of this project that I mentioned to you. Uh, I made some artists angry when I published uh, an article and said that I took artist commodity and recycled it like junk and made it meaningful. And that unfortunately uh, made some people, uh, upset some people. I recall my father the way that he, in the barrio, where many of the uh, young people didn't go to school, for many reasons, they just, they had to work. Uh, the way that he got us all involved and interested in going to college, first finishing high school and then going to college, was he took us out and he used the built environment, the cultural landscape, the urban form as a teacher. He would deal on, with the social, spatial realities of the environment. He would take us to the railroad yards and he would say, look what that man is doing. And look who he is. And then who is the boss? Then he would take us downtown. Who are the people carrying the briefcases and driving the cars? And who are the people that don't have jobs? Etc. So he used the built environment as teacher. That's why I know it has power. I know that when I read, uh, and when I first heard your name, or read your name, was in the image of the city by Kevin Lynch. And that book originally came out as an art book. It had a little thing on the back, art. Now it's architecture and planning. And he was very kind to mention your name, Professor Kepish, and the role you played in teaching him to see. At, but however, that first book dealt with form and not with content, and I, I was somewhat perplexed. Later, of course, as he expanded, he did deal with that, and that was extremely interesting in the way that that developed. So, uh, yes, I have uh, my, some of my work, and uh, I'll mail you copies of the slides of that project uh, that yeah. I, uh, the, I developed the concept and that was the, the coordinator for the entire uh, project. And like I said, we had 20 some odd people. Had a geographer was my primary uh, uh, collaborator. Uh, Did you know Kevin Lynch? I met uh, Professor Lynch uh, uh, at uh, UC Berkeley on the campus at Cal. Yes, I met him. Uh, shortly before his death. Uh, and uh, uh, Appleyard, Professor Donald he Appleyard. He died too. Yes, he, as a matter of fact, after I left teaching at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, I resigned teaching there. And, uh, and uh, it was very simple as to why I resigned. I, I, I mentioned to the dean that I felt that I wanted to take leave because the curriculum would destru was destructive to my culture. It had to be broadened and destructive to my community. And I felt that it should be broadened. And I wanted to do research in order to, to implement new, design new courses. Very much in line with, they were not new in terms of the work that you were doing, but I had learned enough from your writings and so forth that I wanted to put these things together. And I also had a model that I actually had done and built. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, after I left teaching, I went and lived and worked with Cesar Chavez and United Farm Workers. As a matter of fact, I have uh, one of the pins that, with your permission, I'll, oh, I'll, I've been mean to put it on from the beginning of this. <laughs> I would put it on too. <laughs> well, in that case, let me put it on. <laughs> May I? Sure. Uh, that uh, after I left, the, uh, the uh, uh, teaching for a while, I, I joined the United Farm Workers for two years and traveled around the valley and uh, uh, met the campesinos first time. I want to know more about the population in California, the rural as well as the urban population. And uh, then after that, I went as a, and became a graduate student, returned to school. I was 51 years of age at that time. I returned for eight years to UC Berkeley to, to take more of the courses that I had never taken when I was in school and they were grinding me out as a technology person, very narrow. So I thought I'd go back and take more liberal arts, psychology, 
history, and, and I had a lot of fun for eight years. And that's when I met Professor Donald Appleyard. When he was killed in that terrible accident in Athens, that is when I finally left. Otherwise, I think that it would still be there. <laughs> so, uh, again, I, I, th this is wonderful that, you <laughs> that we're sitting here talking about these things so informally. But you, your friendship and your uh, influence uh, with uh, Kevin Lynch, he time and again mentioned your name, wrote about it. We were close friends and we were co-director of a project but became his book Im Image, of, was it Image of the City or what? Was yes, it? you received a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, yes. I think $100,000 or so, I which was a big money at that details, time. But it was, uh, mm -hmm. What happened exactly? I understand that uh, you announced we have nothing to report and uh, then... Uh, I cannot recall what it was, but my own nature was not a systematic exploration of anything. I think with my heart and with my eyes and Kevin was a brilliant man but also a brilliant heart, at least a very warm-hearted guy. And that was, your, that was your way in? Actually, Kevin was my student for a while. When I came to MIT, he just came back from the war, from the Pacific, and he took courses at MIT and took one of my course. But uh, he was actually a, a giant in his spirit. Oh, yes. He was a great human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we see his family still practically every month. Mm-hmm. His last uh, book, uh, uh, I think that that was published to when? Uh, 1982? Uh, I don't really remember. Mm -hmm. In any case, he, he gave a great deal to all of us. And you know, he had this tragic, not tragic, and this peaceful dream slept away from this world. Oh. He was reading and died in reading. When, while he was reading? Yeah. Tell me, where may I see your paintings? Is there a local gallery? Yes, I don't know. I would take you to my studio because I have a fair amount of material. I will have a, a mini museum in Budapest and I was just preparing to send my work. I wish I had the energy, but I, I will see. How long are you staying here? Till Monday. But uh, like I say again, uh, that uh, you read so much about, uh, even mm. books published by MIT Press, it says, and you took up painting again, and I always say, well, I, I never re Because I never through the readings, I could see painting. that the, the, that there were the, below that. that. Do you have this? I think I brought down this catalog of MIT. If you are willing to b grab, I think that's it. If you don't mind. Have you ever seen this one? Yes, I believe I've seen. Oh, that may interest you. That's was. Lecture, lectures in Mexico. Tres conferencias. Teatro de Arquitectura. En la capital, Mexico. You still speak good. Always. That oh. never leaves you. That never leaves It leaves, you. left me because I spoke a good Hungarian and now uh, it's a very rusty Hungarian. I can give you one if you are interested. Yes, yes. Are you interested in photography too? Oh yes. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I agree with it was with. Uh, well, you just have to look at the recent election and know about the, the power of video and photography and how things are packaged, but uh, photography is a fine art. Is uh, 
has always been, you know, one of my interests. I, I, I don't, I have a difficult time separating it, I, separating the, the various le levels. I just see it as various levels. I don't see that there is a separation. It's a continuum, whether it's photography. I know when, as a child, I used they to water my mother. interdependent entities. Yes, I know as a child at home, uh, my mo one of my tasks was to uh, water the, the, the plants. My mother, she had hundreds in, 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 in coffee cans, and I'd water them. Then I would draw them. I would draw the plants, and then one time our house, uh, the wallpaper was peeing off. So I finished peeing it all off in the kitchen, and all the cracks in the, in the plaster, I traced them with, with pencils. <coughs> and then I, I colored the various patches of plaster uh, with primary colors like yellow and red and so forth, all over. My parents didn't stop me. You know, and it looked just like the plants that I used to water. So I, that interest was always yes, there. I, was, I mean, it was, I could explore throughout the house, you know. So I never have uh, seen these things separately. It's interesting that... Uh, That's not mine, this mm -hmm. is just... I will... Um, I will make you a, a copy of uh, some of this, uh, that, that project that I told you uh, about. Would be very As a matter of fact, when I returned to Cal, UC Berkeley, uh, I did all my coursework for a graduate degree. I got my master's in architecture there, and then I did all my coursework for landscape architecture, and my thesis is, that, is on that project that I did that uh, urban design project where I used all these artists and uh, my primary collaborator was a, a, a geographer because I wanted to, 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 to get an insight as to the, 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 the social uh, uh, spatial qualities of the, the, of the state. But that might be of interest and I will... Anyway. Whatever you could give me as a background to your the own work and this gives you a big summary of my own work. Jeannie La Barbara, I've seen this before, although I don't have a copy of it. No, if you want to have ah, it. Ah, yes, finish. thank you very much. I saw this, Jeannie La Barbara showed it to me, but I had seen it before in the libraries. But now I'm very fortunate to have my own copy, thanks to you. I kind of feel as though the camera is intruding in our privacy now. <laughs> in any case, the question whether our private conversation has a relevance in terms of the video or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. These, uh, I read a, of, uh, a book by Mahoney Nodge, and when you, when you started the um, the new Bauhaus in Chicago, and I made use of the concept you had when you when you had this of stringing lights over uh, the lake, uh, the Great Lakes, when you were doing consulting work for oh, the, yes. uh, you, uh, the the United States government, right. and the <laughs> idea that it if was. we were invaded, they'd drop the bombs into the lake. <laughs> That's a fantastic idea, and so consequently, on various projects. Uh, I did, uh, I was consultant to a, a, a uh, uh, to a consultants, urban design consultants in, in, a, in a Mexican community in Southern California. And I used that idea uh, in the street where I, 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 uh, I created some myths and, uh, and I began to, I sort of seeded these myths around because these freeways were tearing the communities apart. And the main street, uh, I told this story, and it was interesting how people picked up on it, about how this dragon came in and how it, it turned the, the serpents into stone, and now we know them as freeways, but they're really serpents that were eating up the... And it's interesting how people elaborate and pick up on stuff like, stuff like that. I am only very sorry that uh, I did not come 21 years ago to meet you and to 
and to get a much closer look at, at your activity at the center. I'm also sorry for many reasons because one brain or gray matter gets grayer and grayer in stage of life and I don't feel I'm as alert now as I'm supposed to be, but 